We're now going to move into a conversation with the new Public Utilities Commission Chairman, Anthony Roisman, moderated by Rev Conference Committee Chairman and Board Member, Carrick Johnson. Thanks, gentlemen, for making your way up. Uh, just four months ago, the governor appointed attorney Tony Roisman to oversee the siting and regulation of energy infrastructure, utility rates, and service quality. It's a big change for Vermont, given that the last chairman served for more than a decade. Uh, prior to his recent work as a private litigator and adjunct professor at Dartmouth College, his early career included time with the Natural Resources Defense Council, the U.S. Department of Justice, and trial lawyers for public justice. In his role as chairman of the Public Utilities Commission, which many of you have known for nearly a century as a public uh, service board previously had a name change, um, the governor has, has charged him with helping to navigate our transition to a cleaner, more affordable energy future that supports stronger economic growth and lower costs for families and employers. Carrick Johnson, Vice President at Velco, has kindly uh, agreed to facilitate our conversation with the new chairman. Some of you may know that later this week, Carrick departs Velco after more than 17 years of service at Vermont Utilities to join Utopus Insights, an energy analytics company owned by IBM, Velco, Boston Consulting Group, and Utopus employees. Utopus Insights combines deep energy industry knowledge with the most advanced data science. It's a spinoff of IBM's research's entire energy analytics team and grew out of the breakthroughs accomplished through their work with Velco um, that's now spread to nearly 20 other utilities here in the United States and abroad. Utopus is based just south of Vermont in Valhalla, New York, and across the pond a little ways in Bangalore, India. Uh, you may call, recall that it's this partnership that uh, created Velco's Weather Analytics Center, an operation that helps maximize and improve integration of renewable energy onto the grid, which received REV's inaugural innovation award at our conference last year. So, gentlemen, I'll ask you to come on up, and thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Um, the chairman and I um, have had a few conversations, and I think it's fair to say there's a hell of a lot of curiosity and interest in what he's going to have to say. We just don't know you as well as we want to currently. I'm going to move this here so I can look at you while we ask these. And since we're a little bit late, I'm going to jump right in. Um, let's start with this. As we've discussed, I want to ask a, little, a few questions of a personal nature, give people a little insight of you as the man, as, as, as someone who's going to be leading the Public Utilities Commission. So I guess my, my first question for you is, why the heck did you want this job? <laughs> Every day, I ask myself the same question. <laughs> I, actually, this, and I've said this to many people, this is the best job that I've ever had. And it's best in so many ways. First of all, the staff of people at the Public Utilities Commission is amazing. They are competent, they're dedicated, they're hardworking. Uh, I couldn't, if I had started from scratch, I couldn't have hired a better group of people. And then my two fellow commissioners, um, Sarah Hoffman, who I've known for years, and Margaret Cheney, who I've only met in this job, uh, bring expertise and talent and, and a real commitment to the work that we do. So to begin with, what a great place to go to work every day. The second thing is, it's what you guys are doing. Uh, to be on the, on the forefront of the best of energy development in this country uh, is, is amazing. Uh, I did the construction permit hearings on behalf of opponents in Seabrook some 40 years ago. And if all the people who were committed to renewable energy had been in the room, it wouldn't have filled one of these tables. 
And to see all of this today and to realize that Vermont is not just moving in the right direction, they're actually leading the charge. Uh, and to be part of that process and help to develop uh, the, the case law and the principles that guide what is going on, uh, I can't imagine anything that I, that I would rather do. Uh, we don't make policy in the same way that the department does, but I will tell you that my goal would be to make the Vermont brand the national brand uh, and make all this country think about these issues the way we do. So that's, that's why I like this job beyond belief. How would you describe your leadership style, and have you led a team of this size before? I ran a section in the Department of Justice that did hazardous waste enforcement. We had about the same number of attorneys and staff people, so roughly in the 20s area, uh, that's, that's not unusual. I, I would say that my, my style um, is to let people be what they're capable of being. And only if they're not capable of being what they need to do uh, would I be likely to step in. Uh, I like to delegate. I have tremendous uh, general counsel uh, uh, and a tremendous uh, chief of the economic branch of the uh, Public Utilities Commission. And I want them to exercise their judgment. I don't want to simply have me make all the decisions and then them just carry them out. First of all, how can you keep competent people working for you if you don't let them be competent? Uh, so I guess that's what I'd call my style. Okay, a little bit of a lead into this one, so bear with me. Um, I don't know if you all saw it, but there was an excellent profile of uh, the chairman that was written by Terry Hallenbeck in the June 14 issue of Seven Days. Now, the headline in this piece was, Meet the 79-Year-Old Man Who Will Oversee Vermont's Energy Future. And they described you this way. At 79, he has the trim build and energetic demeanor, as well as the quick, retentive mind of a much younger man. So I ask you, Chairman. <laughs> let me ask the question. Could you say anything more than that? <laughs> How long do you see yourself serving in this role? Well, I have a six-year term, and I can't predict who the governor will be in six years. But I don't see any finite limit to how long I would serve in this. I, I noted that, for instance, um, Warren Buffett is 85. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 84. Uh, I feel as though Maybe I'm a little young for the position, <laughs> and I'm hoping to, to make up for that with my enthusiasm and energy level. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another little bit for lead-in. Many have credited you with having a top-notch legal mind, but it's also just as clear you have a heart, like all of us in this room, if not in this state, that's really um, moved by the beautiful Vermont landscape, especially her mountains. The governor that chose you continues to support a moratorium on any ridgeline wind development, and you have repeatedly stated that you are personally opposed to ridgeline wind development. Given these facts, would you concede that securing a permit from the commission for such a project as a, uh, this, such a uh, wind project has become significantly more difficult? No, I would not concede that at all. The, the job that I have is not to be the policymaker for the state of Vermont on energy. It's to be part of the decision-making process where we implement the laws and the regulations, and we reach our decisions based upon the records that are in front of us. If the record supports the issuance of permits, we grant them. If it doesn't, we don't. And the fact that I might personally feel one way about wind turbines on high ridge lines is no more relevant than that I root for the Washington Redskins and not the Boston Patriots. Okay. Well, that does open the question, though, so let me ask, given, especially given the, this, uh, this forum, do you personally support solar? 
Yeah, I, not only do I personally support it, we are looking seriously into having it installed at our barn that we're building. Um, so yes, I, I personally support solar. Do you personally support large scale hydro? If, if we're talking personally, sure. Yeah, I think large scale hydro has a, has a role to play. I don't know whether I would support it if it meant damming up the Colorado River and, <laughs> and wiping out the Grand Canyon, but yes. Do you personally support biomass fueled energy? Sure. I, in fact, just last night we had a little biomass energy at our house because it was <laughs> chilly <laughs> and we burned wood. <laughs> okay. Do you personally support natural gas? I, I use propane. We don't have natural gas where we live. Uh, I would rather not have to use a fossil fuel, but uh, I also would rather not freeze to death in the winter. You were in the same piece I referenced in seven days. Um, in, in that piece, according to Terry, you described yourself as an energy efficiency aficionado. First, is that accurate, that quote? And secondly, what do you think makes you one? Well, all right, it, yes. I, I don't know whether I'd say an aficionado, maybe more a fanatic. Um, uh, I'm. I, I turned down the thermostat. You know, uh, my my wife is from Germany. And uh, when we were uh, building our house, she wanted to make sure that we didn't waste energy by heating the house unnecessarily, and that if we needed air in the house, we should open the windows. Um, so uh, yes, I am, I am a fanatic about it. In, in terms of its uh, implementation, I think that any kilowatt saved is a kilowatt generated. And it's, it's no more useful to waste energy than it is to waste food or time or anything else. Uh, when I, as I mentioned before, when I did the uh, Seabrook yeah. case, uh, we hired, uh, hired, we had available to us the uh, Environmental Policy Center at Dartmouth College, and they presented a case on our behalf on energy efficiency. And uh, they argued at that time, this was in the 1970s, that virtually all the energy that was to be generated by uh, uh, Seabrook, and at the time it was expected to be a two-unit plant, so we're talking about 2,300 megawatts, was available in energy conservation in New England without ever building any nuclear plants at all. Uh, ultimately, we ended up with uh, one Seabrook plant, and the eight nuclear plants that were scheduled in the early 1970s for New England, uh, only one was ever built. And the principal reason for that was energy conservation in New England. Two more. Do you believe human activity driven climate change is a fact? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the la <laughs> last one. Do you personally support Vermont's policy of 90% renewable by 2050? I think it's a great policy, and I think the people in this room are the implements to make it happen. Uh, we're we're more like the we're like a gatekeeper. Uh, we've been told who should come through the gate and who shouldn't. So don't show up with a coal plant at the Public Utilities Commission. We're not likely to get let you through the gate, but we are the gatekeepers to make it possible for that goal to be met. Thank you. Well, let's shift a little bit to the commission and some broader issues. You started as PUC chairman on June 12th. In terms of serving as chair, where would you say you are in your own personal learning curve? Oh, maybe 10% in at this point. Um, I still have an enormous amount to learn. My, my prior experience was primarily with nuclear. Uh, and with some uh, renewable energy projects that my clients believed uh, were inappropriate. And uh, all the nuances of both renewable energy, energy conservation, energy distribution, rates, rate design, those are all things that I'm, I'm learning. And luckily, as I said before, I have a staff and I have two commissioners 
who provide me with a lot of guidance. Any early surprises? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest surprise that I've had is that we have not done two things that I'm hoping we will be doing more of. One, we've not been making clear to the people who come to us asking for something, petitions, how much we expect from them before we're willing to entertain their petitions, what kind of, of detail. We cannot make good decisions if we don't have good records. We can't make good records if the parties don't give us that information. And the other piece is that we have a huge number of people who appear before us on a regular basis without lawyers or with very limited resources. And we need to, and we are, making major changes so that everybody that has something to say has an opportunity to say it and that we give enough guidance so that people are able to say what they need to say in the most effective way. Uh, that's the way we can do the best job. That's the way we're least likely to make a mistake. And incidentally, we will make mistakes. Hmm. But the Supreme Court is there, um, and, uh, and we hear about them. Thank you. Uh, a little lead in for this one. In the June 1st Valley News headline, Scott appoints Hanover Co-op Board President as Public Service Board Chairman. At that time, they called it the board. You stated the Public Service Commission in this state has such a wealth of resources that increase the possibilities that we can make sound decisions that will be beneficial to the state of Vermont. You have a staff of 25? Currently? Yes. And, and, and over, would you say that staff and your overall budget, is it sufficient in your view to faithfully discharge the commission's responsibilities? I, th I, think, I think it is. The, those of you uh, who know how we are funded will know that we are not funded with taxes. We're, we're funded with a uh, production uh, tax on a certain subset of the people who appear in front of us, uh, that it, which is primarily the large uh, uh, electric and gas uh, utilities. And that tax varies with what they sell. So the more energy conservation there is, the more renewable energy there is, the less we may, we may have in the way of a budget. And we're working on ways now to, to look into how we can increase the contribution that everyone who comes to us asking for something bears part of the cost of the operation of the office. But I think, I think in terms of the size of our office, we're probably at a good size, but, and this is an important but, if everyone who appears before us doesn't do their job, we can't do our job. Yeah, and I, I do want to get into that. Did the workload surprise you? And no. is it rising? Is it rising? It is rising. I mean, particularly net metering uh, is uh, going up astronomically, but as those of you in this room know, uh, we modified our net metering rules before I got there. Um, to make it far easier for you to apply for small net metering projects, which basically are now done uh, by registration. So that helps with the workload. Thank you. And various reports, you've been very clear that you're trying to increase access, and you've already stated that a couple times. Let me uh, um, repeat a quote that you had said and leads to a question. One of the things I hope to be able to do, you said, Working with the other two commissioners and our staff is to make it easier for people who want to have a say in a, in a decision we are making to have that say. In that, way, in that vein, you've described the 147-page report, recommendations to promote increased ease of citizen participation in PSB proceedings, which is a mouthful, as an implementation roadmap for the PUC in order to facilitate the broadest possible participation. Which of this report's recommendations are your top five or ten priorities? I don't think of them in terms of, of priorities, so I'm not okay. sure I can answer it quite that well, way. Well, which ones are you going to move fastest on? Well, the, one of the things is our hearing room. Uh, Sarah Hoffman is leading up our effort to make our hearing room interactive and accessible to people anywhere in the state. And our goal is 
that an attorney or a witness or a public participant who's a party to a proceeding can participate in our proceedings by sitting in their office or their home anywhere in the state and appear in front of us and cross-examine as appropriate or be cross-examined by witnesses. Uh, that, I think, will help tremendously expand. Uh, the second thing that we're doing is we're working on guides and aids to the public to better understand how the process works. I think we have looked in the past more like we were kind of an, an ivory tower and you needed to have a special ticket in order to get in. Uh, that's not how we will operate, not how we should operate. So we are going to make it easier for the average Vermonter without a lawyer to participate actively in our, in our processes. And let me just say as a lawyer, I think of all the things that happen in front of us, probably the least valuable, which is not to say not valuable, but the least valuable are lawyers. The most valuable are fact witnesses and experts. That's what we learn. The lawyers tell us what we should do with the facts and what we should do with the expert opinions. But without those facts and expert opinions, we don't get to do our job. Are there any other specific changes you, you have in, in mind? I, and I want to ask you, maybe as part of that answer to that, um, I, I think there has been some, some rejected, if we can speak about this, some rejected, I believe there are net ma metering applications. So why don't we start with the specific and go to the more general. What, what do you expect in terms of filings? Um, because I think that's something that it would be good for this audience to know. And what other specific changes beyond that are you hoping to accomplish? Okay. Um, we have a set of rules that describe what it is we need to see in order for an application to be processed by us. And we are uh, making an effort to make sure that every application, whether it's received from the largest utility or the smallest net metering installer, that those applications fulfill the obligations of our regulations. And there is a transition period. Uh, I, I, can, I see people out here, although I, don't, I can't put a name with a face, who probably got a rejection letter from us. Um, and uh, that's because we expect everyone to do their job so that we can do our job. So fill out the applications, submit the information, based upon what it says in our regulations. Once that happens, then we can start the process of reviewing the application, inviting any participants who want to participate, and do their job. Okay, th thank you. And no other, um, I, I, let me just ask one more time, any other specific changes beyond, I think you mentioned the hearing room and that uh, Commissioner Hoffman was leading that charge. You've talked about a, a, perhaps a more disciplined approach and more rigor attached to what are the, in these filings. Any other specific thing it would be good to tell the audience, I mean, well, here's what's all, coming. Well, what I said before about the, the guides and aids to, so that the public can participate okay. more effectively. Okay. We are going to uh, start this fall, uh, the, uh, the other two commissioners and I uh, doing uh, what, for lack of a better term, we'll call a listening tour. We need to talk to all the stakeholders, the people who apply for things from us, the people who participate in the process either in favor or against something that's in front of us, the state agencies that appear regularly uh, in front of us and find out what they feel we need to do better, what they like that we're doing now, and what they don't like that they'd like us to stop doing. And that'll take several months, but the goal is to uh, get fully educated from the public uh, and all the stakeholders uh, outside the context of an individual proceeding where obviously things are more limited. I, I'm going to come back to that in a sec in any second because I have a set of questions around that, so thank you for raising that. Back to that report quickly. It, fundamentally, it envisions a very close, effective working relationship with the Public Service Department, several of the recommendations in that report. So let me ask you this. How would you describe your current relationship with PSD Commissioner June Tierney? Well, let me say this. She had dinner at my house last night. 
Uh, <laughs> she, uh, we did not talk shop. Uh, it, it, June is a remarkable woman, and the department is really blessed to have her at, at, as its head. And as you know, she was the general counsel of the public, when it was the Public Service Board for many years. Uh, I see her as an important advocate in front of us, providing us with the information we need, even when nobody else is providing it, with regard to decisions that we have to make. And uh, her staff uh, is uh, full of extremely talented experts and lawyers. Uh, and so we look to the department to provide us with input into decisions. A couple quick questions. Again, that report, as you described as a roadmap, do you support mandatory mediation for, for parties in front of you? We have, we have contracted with uh, Harvard uh, law school which has a mediation project and they are working with us their students are working with us uh, to uh, develop uh, a pilot project on mediation uh, personally having been through the court systems I think mandatory mediation uh, is absolutely essential and my view of mediation is that in some cases you can mediate all the way to the conclusion and you end up with the parties making a decision on their own. Uh, but even then, we have an obligation under statute. So if an applicant and the department both agree that something should happen, we still have to be sure that what they agree to meets our criteria. But we also think you can mediate issues. So a case that looks like it's got 20 issues may actually only have three. And it's much better for everyone if we can get the 17 issues that are resolvable out of the way and stay focused on the three that are critical. Uh, and that's part of what we hope to do with mediation. Uh, we are big fans of people working things out. Is there a model in your mind where your type of public participation, public access, the way the system runs, is there a model where it's in place that Vermont and the regular community and other stakeholders to look to as something you're seeking to replicate? Does what you intend to do exist somewhere? Frankly, not, not that I can think of. But, uh, candidly, I think it's more that I know what we don't want to do. Years of practicing in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission <laughs> taught me how not to do it. Uh, uh, every time I appeared there, I had a lesson learned <laughs> about public participation. But in terms of, I mean, like so much else, I think Vermont is going to, is going to lead the way in some respects. Yes, there are components of things, there, there are mediation programs that exist around the country, and, and that's one of the things the Harvard students are helping us see, who is doing this. And we don't, we don't want to invent the wheel again if we don't have to. Uh, but at the end, I think it'll be Vermont's own version of public participation that is going to set a standard. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you support providing funding for interveners paid for by project petitioners? Personally, I think that the idea that the applicants for petitions, particularly uh, large utilities, use ratepayer money to pay for their participation, but that the public that participates doesn't have any money to use for their participation seems like a disconnect to me. Uh, I always was troubled by the fact that I was helping to pay uh, for the uh, cost of the company whose position I was opposing. Uh, and I will tell you that when I moved to New Hampshire, which I did before I moved to Vermont, I was trying to get here, but I could only get as far as Lyme, New Hampshire. Uh, we could see Vermont from there, but I wasn't in it yet. Uh, I was shocked to find on my bill from Public Service Company of New Hampshire, there was a charge for uh, stranded costs associated with the failures of uh, Public Service of New Hampshire uh, related to Seabrook. And I called up and I said, you know, this doesn't seem right. I had expert witnesses that testified at the construction permit hearing for Seabrook that have 
public service were to build this plant, they would go bankrupt. And of course, that's what happened. I said, it seems unjust that I should now be paying for the mistake that you made in the face of what we told you you shouldn't do. Uh, needless to say, that fell on deaf ears. <laughs> Vermont is the only state uh, in New England in our region that doesn't allow retail choice of electricity provider. Should that change? I have no opinion on that at this point. Do you have any other beyond, beyond public participation and ensuring it has access, any other large visions of where you want to take this commission? Take the commission is a little, uh, I, I am only- Lead the commission. Well help the commission move in a direction. Uplift the commission. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, that, this, that the state is at a, a really important crossroads. We have, we have the energy goals set by the legislature, and we know where we're supposed to end up, but we don't know what the path is to get there, and we have to balance the health of the companies who are doing the providing the health of the companies who distribute, uh, and the uh, interests of the ratepayers. And in this state, so far, the decision has been made that the great bulk of the cost of this transition from carbon to no carbon, from energy inefficiency to energy efficiency, should be borne by the ratepayers and not generally by the taxpayers. And my hope is that we can develop a way to get from here to there without, one, bankrupting anybody, and two, without making it impossible for people to live in this state because of the costs that they have to bear in order to use energy in the state. And uh, candidly, I don't know how we get from here to there. And I think one of the ways is to continue the process that we've already put in place to invite stakeholders to come and talk to us about rates, uh, rate design ultimately, uh, the implementation of uh, all this alternative energy uh, in the state, all of these things we have to be able to reconcile. And hopefully with the talent that the state has available to it, we'll get the information and be able to come up with a solution so that when we come to the 27th one of Rev, that we will have already demonstrated that you can be clean, you can be efficient, and you can be economical. And uh, that's my goal. Okay, so you invoked the phrase stakeholders. Let me ask you some quick questions. Um, well, and let me first just say thank you for, I, I should have said this at the outset, thank you for agreeing to do this. I mean, I, I know it's a lot of hours, and really for your sacrifice, thank you for doing that. Well, I, I, I okay, that's the love. it for okay, a world. Got it. Okay. Um, we got the love out of the way. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, have you met with any members of the, like, have you met with any utilities since you've assumed this uh, position? We have not formally met. Uh, with anybody yet. That was, that's, that's sort of our fall agenda. And those of you who woke up this morning to frost know that it's now fall. So uh, we are implementing that process and uh, we intend to meet with, the, with utilities. We've had some people from the, uh, uh, re the renewables, uh, uh, energy efficiency, and uh, people who represent uh, citizens concerned about energy futures in, the, in Vermont, uh, but our goal is to do something more systematic than that. And you, many of you in this room will get uh, an invitation from us soon to uh, suggest uh, locations and times when uh, we can sit down and have uh, a candid conversation, obviously non-case specific, about what we do and how we do it. Well, that list of stakeholders include municipal, include municipal officials. Of course, they're part of Vermont. And all of these meetings will, are starting to begin, the invites will go out so people can expect that's when that kind of outreach is starting. That's correct, okay. yes. Um, okay, quick quote, you had a great quote in the, uh, that Neil Goswami in the Vermont Press Bureau did again June 1st. 
yada, yada, yada. The, uh, you give love to the other two commissioners, the quality of the other two commissioners, the staff of the Public Service Board, which is just an outstanding group of people, the citizens, and of course, all the utilities who are, in my experience, in dealing with utilities, are a very special group of companies, thank you, who are trying to do the right thing for Vermont. That combina combination makes for just a tremendous opportunity to do good, and it's something I'm really looking forward to. You didn't say anything about renewable energy developers. Should we read anything into that? No. Good, then we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the regional national picture. Um, let, let, me, let me lay out a, a, a plain picture for you here. Whether through your help or not, Vermont's lone nuclear plant is now decommissioned. The state has the highest, as we've heard a couple speakers already talk about, the state has the highest per capita rate of clean energy jobs in the nation, electric rates, although New England is an expensive region, are among the lowest, uh, if not the lowest, the next to lowest in New England. We are experiencing a blossoming of customer and cust community owned solar generation. Vermont's utilities, including the state's largest GMP, earn, earn among the highest customer satisfaction ratings in the nation. Two of Vermont's utilities have achieved 100% renewable energy portfolios. The state led the way nationally in efficiency and transmission governance. Regulators have been among the most progressive and innovative in the nation, and we have an incredibly engaged and dynamic citizenry. Do you see Vermont as a national energy success story? Oh, yes. I think, as I, I, think I said at the beginning, I, I think Vermont, it's, it's a unique state in so many ways, from the access to government, uh, the fact that on Wednesday mornings you can walk into the governor's office and talk to the governor directly, that the legislature, the only restriction is that you are not supposed to carry a firearm uh, when you walk into the legislature. You can go into committees. You can talk to your legislators. Uh, this is a very, very special place. And everything that Vermont has done in the energy area demonstrates how it's able to lead. And we, unlike, say, California and New York, which are both also trying to be innovative, we're not, we're not a battleship. We're a PT boat. We can turn on a dime. We can maneuver through the difficult aspects of this transition uh, much better than other jurisdictions. And I think people can and will look to us. Okay, so we have like a minute and 30 seconds. So these are quick, just a series of quick questions. Right, but I want to correct something. You suggested that I had something to do with the death of Vermont <laughs> Yankee. I just want to be clear. It wasn't a killing. It was a suicide. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. You're welcome for that layup. Okay, it's a nice softball. Okay, um, very quickly, uh, pop quiz here. What news sources do you rely on to stay informed? Quickly, we gotta go. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, sir, All please. Right. I, the, the primary sources are the people in our office uh, who come to me all the time with information that, that they gather. In terms of, you know, what do I read? I read the New York Times, I read the Valley News, um, and, but mostly I talk to people who know what they're talking about uh, in our office okay. and witnesses at hearings. Okay, you self-identify as a Democrat. Are you a Bernie supporter? I like Bernie Sanders a great deal. Uh, I would say that the more I see of, of Vermont party politics, that I'm more and more a person rather than a political party advocate. This one may be too, I think I was gonna ask about your wife. It's Gabrielle and she's a physician. Yes. Do you, do you count, does she help you make decisions, sort things out? Oh, yes. All, all the time. <laughs> In every way. There's nothing good. I'm just going to leave that alone. Okay. Okay, you have six cats. Yes. Six cats. There's no question there. Just six cats. <laughs> I'm sorry. A perfect, just, perfect training for this job. <laughs> <laughs> with that, let's thank the chairman with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.